Hey, Sarah. Hey, Veronica. How's it going? It's good. And hi to everyone else out there. Welcome to Thick as Thieves. This is the Art Heist podcast that we've been doing for the last couple of months now. And it is a collaboration between two besties in Nashville. Me, (laughs) Veronica. And me, Sarah. And we are PIs, but we are also art lovers. And we have a background with art. So we talk about art heist. That's just a fusion of both those worlds coming together. Um, Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about a really awesome art heist in just a second. First, you got any art news updates or anything that you've seen? I want to talk to you about Vegas. Just tell me about Vegas. (laughs) Well, I want to talk about one aspect of Vegas. So listeners, I was in Vegas this weekend and I went to the, they have a neon museum. And it is so what it is is basically a graveyard for neon signs in Vegas. They're all from Vegas. So basically, and the museum opened in 2012. Hmm. The collection's been going since I think it's like 1992 or 93. But basically, when they were kind of imploding buildings and when they would tear down buildings in Vegas, the signs would go with them until finally a collector stepped in and was like, we need to preserve the history of Las Vegas. So give us all of your signs that are just going to be destroyed anyways. Definitely the most beautiful part of Vegas. All the neon. Totally. So this thing is basically a gravel lot with just a bajillion neon signs. Some of them are lit up. It's all outdoors. Yeah, it's all outdoors. And it's like, if you imagine just like a used car lot with just like kind of shitty old used cars Mm -hmm. just laying around everywhere. That's sort of what this is. So it's a really weird experience. I've just never been to a quote unquote museum like this. Yeah. Um, I just had a lot of kind of mixed feelings about it. I really liked it, but also it was just sort of sad to see all these incredible signs for casinos and motels and all sorts of things. All from Vegas. All from Vegas. There's only one sign that's not from Vegas and it's from Utah. And it ha- the reason why it's there is because the company that first started doing, like when they switched from light bulbs to neon, mm-hmm. there was a company that had a sign in Utah and donated it. I don't know why. There's only one. <laughs> so does that mean that other places that have neon signs can donate them to the neon sign graveyard? No. This one just happens to be relevant. It, it, it fits into the narrative of the the history of neon in Vegas. But it was really cool to walk around. I I recommend it. Great. If, I've never been to Vegas. Well, it's not a great city, but <laughs> some people disagree. Yeah, I know. A lot of people like it, but I'm like not David Hickey. <clears throat> Remember that guy? Yeah. Oh yeah. Air guitar. Mhm. Yeah, Pirates and He's kind of What is his What is his book called? Pirates and Oh my goodness. Or he hasn't disappeared, but I haven't seen his name in a while. I don't I didn't read the Pirates one. I just read Air Guitar. But um he Guitar is good. such a champion of Vegas. Um almost he almost got me to want to go visit it at least, but I, it's just never been a place I've wanted to go. Hence I've never been there. And anytime I mean there, there's the novelty of it which is fun, but also to me a lot of it's really corny. There's just a lot of corny stuff about Vegas. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's the old Vegas, which is very cool. I mean, there's a lot of really cool aspects, but I, I just think it's a very, it's it's sort of a bizarre town. Sorry, I'm, I really want to find out what that Pirates. Oh, yeah. Take your time. Book it. Pirates and Farmers. Par- pirates of the Caribbean. That's what no. it is. <laughs> pirates, and, <laughs> pirates and Farmers. Essays on Taste. That's what it is. That's a great book. It's it a is. a really great book. Yeah. Um, so that came after Air Guitar. <laughs> I think so. Anyways, yeah. Neon Sign, Sign Museum in Vegas is really... It would be very hard to steal from there. It would be so hard to steal from there. But actually, so I was, of course, like drilling the docent with questions, probably in an annoying way. But she was telling me that people, the reason why they turned it into a museum in the first place at all, because it was a private collection. And the reason they made it a museum was because people were hopping over the gate to get in. Like it was just like a lot with a, you know, a fenced in lot. And that kids would hop the fence to, like, go roam around at night in this neon graveyard. Would they keep the lights on then? No. Okay, no. so they would just go look at them, but they weren't lit up. Yeah, because there's so many that mm. it's it just looks insane. And they're all on the ground, so you realize how huge these signs are. Yeah. Um, so signs that may look kind of small when they're way up in the air. Like, when you get them down on the ground and you stand in front of them, they're actually massive. Right. Um, so she said that people were would, would hop the gate and 
walk around. So finally, they were just like, you know what? If people want to see this, let's just let them in. Let's just arrange it all in a way that people can kind of walk through and mm. see it. So that's, that's cool. cool. Which one was your favorite? My favorite was actually not not even a neon sign. <laughs> My favorite there, it, I guess it was a, an aspect of a neon sign. But it is a pool player. It's like a man playing pool. And I'm assuming there was like... pool? Yeah, there is like a billiards hall probably. Uh. And this and this was part... But he's giant. I'm sure this is on I'm, the internet. I love pool. Yeah, so he's just this very large statue here. Look at this. Oh, my. And he's all rusty and... Strange, but it, it was just a cool part wow. of the museum. There were a lot of really great neon How signs. big is he... Okay, I'm looking at a sculpture of a man holding, like, exactly like what you just said. Yeah, it's like a metal sculpture. But how big is this again? Or how tall? <laughs> I'm so bad at this. I want to say 40 feet? Okay. Maybe. I don't know. So that's probably like worst, 100. That's the worst guesstimation. Oh, wait. I don't know. Can I reveal something about you to everybody? <laughs> yeah, go um, ahead. So Sarah and I and some other people were hanging out at a bar the other day. And this music <laughs> comes on. And one person hanging out with us who happens to know a bit about Sarah's ability to not <laughs> detect what music is or so, I don't know. Anyway, he just goes, what kind of music is this, Sarah? She said, Hawaiian music. So I was Never. in the bathroom while that happened. And then I sat down and he said, Veronica, what kind of music would you say this is? And I'm like, it's salsa. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Sarah's thinks that salsa music is Hawaiian music. Apparently, I don't know my music, and I think that Hawaiian (laughs) music is salsa music. Right. (laughs) But the woman behind the bar was wearing a Hawaiian shirt, so I thought it was like a themed night. I don't know, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) I was learning something new every day. Now I will, I really know how to tell the difference between salsa music and Hawaiian music. Have you like gone into a whole thing where you're listening to a bunch of salsa now? No. Well, (laughs) maybe I should time to do that you want to hear about my heist oh please tell me about your heist Heist of the day please. um so i'm gonna talk about stefan bright weiser i hope i'm saying his name right it is french so i feel like i'm saying it wrong but <laughs> well we'll just say it the way we want to say it yeah he is known as potentially the best art thief ever ever yeah and we'll evaluate if we think that's true or not at the yeah end. yeah he's got a lot to live up to there have been some Pretty impressive one. I would say maybe he was to a point. Okay. You know, like, I'm just going to open with this and then we'll talk about him. You know how there are people who they become good at something and not only they become good at it, it is they become good at something that they love Mm -hmm. because you can be good at something you don't love. Yeah. And they become good at something that they love and then they keep doing it and they get better at it and it reaches a fever pitch and then they like get to that point where they're blind like they they're Mm. so confident about their ability to do it that they just take all sorts of risks and keep doing it right yeah it seems like there's probably a term for that i know i was just about to say what is the term for that maybe it's one of those words that like doesn't exist in english but exists in german or something right it's definitely like something along obsession Mm -hmm. compulsion delusions of grandeur delusion (laughs) all those shuns like (laughs) combined so this guy stefan breitweiser he was born in 1971. I'm going to tell the story in a bit of a linear fashion because for me, even though I prefer a narrative arc that's sort of jumping around a timeline, Mm -hmm. this one I kind of would rather take us from the beginning. When he was born, his first word, what he ate, just kidding. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) No, but I just want to go in order of sort of his life to see if how that will. Okay, let's give it a shot. How that will work. Because I keep trying to throw timelines around and I don't know. This is a new a new thing. Yeah, I feel like most of our Go in order. most of our high stories are jumping all over the We're place. We're like, so then <laughs> but, but back no, it up, back it up, back Forty it up. years before that. <laughs> oh no, and then five hundred years before that, that artist made that thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna all try right. to see if I can avoid obviously it's gonna happen a bit because with art heist, it's like a timeline clusterfuck situation yeah. because you are dealing with someone stealing something that was usually made hundreds of years ago. So in that sense, timelines become very clashy. So just to situate this guy, he was born in the 70s in the northeastern part of France, and he spoke French and German and English, and his father was a sales executive in Switzerland. His mom was a nurse. He was an only child. These things are important, trust me. Okay. <laughs> the, his family makes matters here. We're going to talk about mitigation in this one a little bit. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about a part of the, our private investigation world. Yeah. And it's some. it's like maybe my favorite 
part. Of, yeah, it's mine. Yeah. Yeah, it's both of ours. So of course, <laughs> we get to talk about it today because it does play into this. So they were well off. They lived in a nice house filled with elegant furniture. They had, you know, furniture from the 1700s and dressers from like the 1800s and different artifacts all over the place. And it was sort of that kind of upbringing. So sophisticated, arty. Yeah, but it was his dad's thing. He loved... I wouldn't even call it bougie because... What is bougie? Well, it was bougie (laughs) in a way, but like... I'm thinking in France, bougie means something kind of different. It usually means like nouveau riche in a way. And, okay, and right. so it's more like people just trying to look like they exist on a certain echelon of when they don't, wealth. Really. Like or they have middle class. For a long time. Yeah. yeah. Or even if they do, they're maybe their generations before them didn't. And right. New it's, money. It's more about just looking the part. Whereas this is, I think his dad came from a background where this was always like a part of his life. So it's he had kind of a fetish for these... Well, not like a fetish, but, you know, <laughs> he was a collector <laughs> of, of these things, like of furniture from historic times. He was like a true right. lover He's of history. He's a connoisseur. Yeah. Okay. His parents had high hopes for Stefan. They wanted him to be a lawyer with like a fancy house, just a continuation of basically what they were. But he dropped out of school very shortly after entering university. And this was kind of the beginning of everything shattering for him in a way. Shortly after that, When he was 22 and still living at home with his parents, his parents' marriage ended explosively. Oh, yeah. That's not good. You know, sometimes that level of childhood trauma, not good. I know. But, and this isn't even childhood. It's, he's 22. 22. Eh, Isn't that still a child? Your brain, you know, all the science that says your brain isn't developed until you're 24, all that mess. Still kind of a child. He's still kind of a child. So in this moment, this explosion, this explosion, his father leaves and takes all of his possessions with him and Breitweiser and his mom are like left alone they can't afford the existence they had before so they end up having to go live in an apartment and she has to work full time um, and support both of them and they replace antiques and furniture that French kings and queens had sat on with Ikea furniture. Was Ikea around then? (laughs) Well yeah because Let's see, he was born in 1971, Uh so this is the 90s. And the 90s was in Europe, right? I mean, I don't know when Ikea started. It was in Switzerland. Or no, Sweden. I mean, Sweden. Yeah, but regardless, they replaced, like, these heirlooms with just mass-produced shit. Like, I don't have a problem with Ikea or whatever, but, you know, it's a big deal for them. Right. It's a big change in class structure. Yeah. Class status. Right. So he is a loner, Stefan, and his mom just lets him continue living in her house he lives in this attic apartment that's like in a small house that she ends up they go from an apartment to a house and Mm -hmm. she just works 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 and he falls in love with a an archaeology scholar of sorts like she's young she's his age named Anne Catherine Kleinklaus so they're both like introverts and he like immediately falls in love with her she has a pixie cut. So do I. Kind of. You have like a... I don't know what it is. Pixie cuts are shorter. Yours yeah. is like a little bit of a grown out pixie cut. Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's just like this... She knows a lot about historical objects and... A lot and they, about seashells. Yeah. Isn't that what archaeology is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seashells. <study> seashells. <laughs> exactly. And <laughs> that's what Kurt Vonnegut said. That's the only reason. He had a degree in archaeology and he was like, yeah, I majored in seashells. And it was one of the cute. cutest... Yeah, it was a cute thing that Kurt Vonnegut said so that is adorable that wasn't my you're not gonna claim it I'm not gonna claim it because all the Vonnegut experts out there would be up in arms totally <laughs> they'd be calling they would be they'd ringing be like, our phone that art heist like... girl just <laughs> heisted <laughs> with her grown-out pixie gun <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's trying to be like Vonnegut <laughs> okay so Continue. they fall in love and she moves into the house with him into the upstairs apartment. Then they, you know, they're a few months into their relationship and they go to a museum in a French village, village of Tan. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. And Breitweiser is with her and he sees this little antique pistol. And he remembers that his dad specialized in collecting like ancient weapons. And that among, was among all the other things his dad specialized yeah, in collecting. Yeah, but that was like his one of his biggest things. He loved old weapons and guns and that sort of thing. And had taken them all with them when he left. Mm-hmm. So he's like looking at it and um, it's it's hand carved. It's from 1730. And he thinks it's even nicer than anything his dad had ever owned from what he remembers of that collection. So he is 
feeling this urge to own this gun. He wants it. And he kind of nudges his girlfriend and says, uh, I want this gun. And she turns to him and says, go ahead, take it. Oh, I like her already. Yeah. <laughs> and he does. Damn. So he takes the gun. He's under the love spell. Yeah. And there's a term. I, I would. I also want to mention that I read multiple. There's a lot out about this guy. But the best essay that I read about him was by um, Michael Finkel. Um, <laughs> I'm so, we're not... <laughs> We don't think your name is funny. <laughs> Except we do. Um, Michael Finkel. <laughs> and he wrote it. Um, he wrote he wrote a story about this guy for GQ. So I just want to say that I'll be quoting him a little bit throughout because I've, of all the essays I read, this one was my favorite, the way he told okay. the story. So Finkel <laughs> is a huge part of <laughs> my po- this podcast today we're gonna have to call him something else we're just gonna have to call him mf or something okay <laughs> we just call him mikey okay mikey um <laughs> yeah this is thick as these or we take your names laugh at them and then turn them into cutesy little appropriations <laughs> that work <Sorry>. for us <laughs> so he steals this and this is the beginning this is the beginning of what becomes their plunder drunk years to use A term that NF came up with. (laughs) Yeah. Plunder drunk. Yeah. So they and his girlfriend, Klein Klaus, becomes his like partner in crime. Okay. So we've got like a Bonnie and Clyde style thing happening. Brings me to it reminds me a little bit of your de Kooning couple in Mm -hmm. Arizona story. But they're a little different unless we don't know everything there is to know about that couple. What were their names again? Rita and Jerry Alter. (laughs) <laughs> just making fun of their name for no reason um <laughs> what we do. yeah no so they're a little bit like that but different they're yeah. quite different you'll soon learn how much their relationship plays into these heists mm-hmm. okay so he got he like got this pistol and then shortly after that he got more things from different museums with her i mean around a hundred objects oh so they would just like go in pick something out take it yeah. together yes okay. and they would He would always take it. She would typically play the part of being on the lookout. Okay. She would let him know if someone was coming, like stand in a certain doorway, be in the car with him, play a part in it, but, you know, to an extent. Mm -hmm. So he said to him, like, according to him, because he has done several interviews, he felt like he had found the meaning of life. Like, he fell in love with this girl, they'd steal these things, and they would take them to this apartment that he lived in, That his mom couldn't even access. He had it locked from her. And he would fill it with these objects. So he's like rebuilding his past life. He's real rebuilding like sort of the the house that he lived in when he was a kid. Except in like a space that's something like 600 square feet. And he's putting it in um, his closet and drawers. It's just like a hoarding, but of, of like incredible objects from... All of the objects, I should mention, that he started stealing and continue to steal, there's one thing they all have in common. They were all made before the Industrial Revolution. (laughs) They were all made before any things were mass produced. Okay. They were all made by hand. Um, And he he really liked ivory carvings, too. Mm -hmm. The weekend after they stole that gun, they went to an art fair in Zurich, and behind a dealer's back, they stole a goblet silver and gold goblet from the 16th century then they went to holland and they stole things from a fair there you know in these booths that were just set up they would just take things while the dealer wasn't looking so they weren't stealing paintings they were stealing objects more or less objects but eventually it became paintings and tapestries too okay and in fact a lot of paintings from the renaissance from museums and breitweiser came to look at his collection i mean it grew and grew and grew hundreds and hundreds of objects that's amazing i know that's a good run yeah and he looked at the renaissance paintings as like the heart of his collection Mm -hmm. i'm sure those were the most difficult to steal they're the most difficult and i feel like i could steal a goblet yeah if i put my heart and soul into it i think you could steal (laughs) a goblet too paintings i think are just a little trickier they're a lot harder um but another thing is that he would never do any damage to the paintings when he stole them. So he had respect. Major respect. Like, one thing is that he... I know so much about how he feels because he's in prison and has been interviewed 
numerous times. So, so we've got a lot of his vantage point. Or yeah, like, a lot know, of his, his reasoning. Yeah. So And he's quite open about it all. He loved going to Belgium. That was the place that he kept wanting to go to steal things. And I think the first painting he stole was actually a still life by Jan van Kessel the Elder, which is like a still life of butterflies flitting around some tulips. Sounds pretty. Yeah. And then he started stealing things by the Bruegels, like the elder and the younger. Mm -hmm. Love them. Mm -hmm. You like the younger. I like the older. (laughs) On and on it went. It was just like so many things. Like the paintings alone that he started stealing were worth millions and millions of dollars. And that's not even including all the objects he started stealing from all these different museums, some small, some, some larger, but a lot of small ones, which Europe is, Western Europe especially, is like filled with these. So, I mean, it's like... A gold-plated hourglass, you know, an iron alms box, copper collection plate, brass hunting bugle, lots of bugles. He loved bugles. (laughs) Plenty of, like, jeweled daggers and, like, ostrich eggs. I mean, it's like... Ostrich eggs? That's a couple of those. Like, ostrich Fabergé eggs? (laughs) Um, Gilded ostrich... There's a gilded ostrich egg in the mix. Love that. Yeah. I'm building up to get to the point, to his most beloved object. I'm never going to let you get to the point. I'm just going to give you (laughs) You're going to just say ostrich eggs. Which kind of eggs? I was going to keep marveling at every single thing he stole. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, it's fun to imagine the space he lives in. They're living like on a heap of some of the most like treasured items. Yeah, that's some cool stuff. Things that survived numerous wars and plagues. Yeah, like I would want to go spend some time in his house. I would want to go to his dinner party where Mm -hmm. he shows me all of his curios. They never had any dinner parties. It was just like he and his girlfriend hung out in their curio cabinet and their mom wasn't even allowed up there. That's dreamy, honestly. It is. Kind of dreamy. It is. I mean, creepy on a a lot of levels. But but there's also something kind of, there's something, I can see the romance and all that. Yes, I can definitely see how it would make for a very hot beginning Mm -hmm. to a relationship, to a total disaster ending. (laughs) But a couple years in, how would you feel like you're living, objects keep accumulating, but the story of their relationship isn't changing. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's something that is going on there. Right. So you get like claustrophobic in your own situation. And Anne is shifting. In her relationship to him. She's getting kind of sick of it. And he's Ooh. he's very... Things are getting tense. Yeah. But I mean, they're still in love. They're still doing it. They, yeah. they go... Every weekend, they go steal something, bring it back. And that's what their whole um, relationship is built on. And the other thing is that the way he looks at this is not just as like, I love these things and I want to have them. I love these objects and I must possess them. But he also thinks he's saving them from a world that will not take care of them. So he's almost... He's looking at his attic which he calls his alibaba's cave that's his that's his term for it. term for this attic apartment filled with objects but he kind of looked at it as as though he's like rescuing animals like that equivalent like he's an activist but for objects because he felt like they all had souls right but he was also hoarding them and i would love to know if his attic was climate controlled if he was even taking good care of those things i doubt it okay yeah but he just thinks that the world would never really appreciate them the way he did sure however with with everything he steals he gets better and better and better each time more confident he knows how to deal with someone walking up to him and stopping him like if a guard would stop him and say like what are you doing and he has an object like in his in the small of his back in the waistline Mm -hmm. he would say oh um i'm about to go get lunch at the cafe and the guard would say, let me see your tickets. And he would have tickets. And then they would go and sit in the cafe, have lunch, hang out while he had an object stuck in his back. Ballsy. I know. He knew that was the way to do things. And she did to act too. totally normal. They just acted very casual. They never wanted anyone to suspect them of stealing things. So they were really good at playing all of those different roles. Um, they knew how to study the floors of museums and knowing which ones made sounds where noticing where cameras were, noticing that a lot of cameras are fake, as in they are not actually connected. They're just there for show, so people Mm -hmm. think they're being watched. And so he just became very good at studying all these things, knowing where certain exit doors are, not really caring where you park the car, just knowing that it's going to be in a way where you can leave at a certain moment. And then also, they would steal things go to the apartment and they would say she would like grow out her hair he would grow a beard so the next museum they'd go to they looked slightly different right 
or sometimes they'd return to that museum to steal something else looking different. Interesting. So, yeah. So they had good, they had, it sounds like they had pretty good strategy. Right. They were smart criminals. They were. He ha- also had a, an opinion that he thought it was tacky for anyone to go into a museum um, with weapons and threaten anybody's life. Like, he just thought that was disgusting. <laughs> I love it. I love criminal standards. Oh, I know. Like, I love how they, uh, you know, almost everyone who I deal with this in my job, but any almost anyone who commits crimes on a regular basis, like, they still have morals and ethics as to what they will and will not do mm-hmm. in terms of, like, say someone who robs banks or robs stores, you know, it, they'll have lines where they, that they don't cross ethically yeah. for them. Which I just find fascinating. Right. Yeah. He would only do these things during the day. He never really, only a few times did he destroy anything, like once he shattered a glass case. So no one ever got hurt. Mm-hmm. I mean, people were lied to, but he wouldn't hurt anyone. He wouldn't even bring a weapon with him. So he was developing a career. He was a career art thief. He never stole these things to sell them. He never stole any of them. He just kept all of them. He was broke while living in this attic apartment his girlfriend worked as a nurse i believe so she went to work every day his mom went to work every day and he just like hung out with his objects and like dusted them off and would go to the local library and like read everything there was to read about all of these objects Hmm. so that was his life oh he also felt like he had an advantage because he had worked as a, a museum security guard for one month when he was like 21 Oh, so that's when all the seeds got planted. A little or bit. Some, like some right the before the divorce. Yeah. Or right after. Something like that. He in that time period, he was he learned a little bit about how to be the security side of a museum. Mm-hmm. But like in a tiny museum somewhere. But he still probably felt like he had some intel. Right. And knew how to beat the system. Right. So when you're someone like this, obviously you have something you really want. You you start developing kind of like a bucket list of what you're going to get. Yeah. They become like prized possessions. And he had one. He had his eye on something that was like, if I can get that, I'm, I feel good about my career. Like, I feel like I have hit a certain point. And it was an ivory sculpture of Adam and Eve by a man named George Patel. It was carved in the 17th century and it was given to Rubens as a birthday, like a 50th birthday present. Oh, wow. So it was kept in the Rubens House Museum in Belgium. And so this is the object that he's he knows like how big is this is this something that he can put in the waistline of his pants or are we talking oh okay it i think it was like 10 to 12 inches high okay okay so not very tall it was like a smallish sculpture but he knew that once he would get that in his apartment it would become the prized possession of his apartment very interesting yeah it's interesting that that's the one that of all things i mean it's got a pretty juicy provenance Mm -hmm. never thought i would say first humans (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> Do you see that's Roman? Sarah that just said that <laughs> not me <laughs> yeah I mean that's it, the story's cool behind it yeah I mean it's the first humans and also he kind of thinks like he and his girlfriend are the only two people in the world mm. in a way because they kind of are the yeah. only people in the world of this and in a way their story's a bit Adam and Evie uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, where she, the first time that he took something, she was the one that said, take it. Oh, you know? oh, nice parallels. And now I don't, okay. he hasn't claimed that that's the reason why. That's, you're making that That's me, parallel. but. Um, I like it. I like it. You know. I approve. Right. So, you know, that's one of the, that's something he's got his eye on or that he wants to own. And prior to that, stealing, so he did steal that one, but I'll get to that in a second because I'm trying to stay on a timeline. He, <laughs> um, he did this heist at the art and history museum in brussels with his girlfriend and it's a museum that has like 150 guards and the reason they they hit it up a few times and took several things here is because one day they were going through it and there was a glass case and there's a sign that said objects removed for study he took that sign out of that case and put it in another one took things out of that and then <laughs> and put it in other cases that he wanted to take objects out of oh that's brilliant yeah it kind of allowed him to return again and again without them ever noticing <laughs> that he had stolen it and he he was very good at removing glass casings um he always kept the swiss army knife with him he also had a collection of skeleton keys of which like he didn't really use that often but there were some things that you know you could open a 
a chest with like one of those keys or mm-hmm. something with one of those keys. So he, those were the tools that he would bring with him all the time and like an oversized jacket. Mm-hmm. Are there photos of him? Mm-hmm. Can I just interrupt you for a second to just ask what he looks like? Yeah, he he kind of looks like um off the top of my head. I want to say he kind of looks like Toby Maguire. Oh, is that who would play him in a movie about this art about M- maybe like the European version of that? But let me get you. A, let's see how you react to. Let's see here. I'm looking at a picture on Veronica's phone. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. He okay. He he just looks like a dude. He looks like a normal dude. No, he's got scary eyes. Yeah. Well, they're eyes that are, he feels, exist only to stare at. I think this dude looks suspicious, but I could also see how maybe he's, I could see how he could be charming in the moment. I mean, he's older in those photos yeah. than the time period I'm talking about. So okay. I yeah. think he was. All right. That's a good visual. That helps me. Okay. Right. I hope everyone listening is Googling Stefan Brightweiser. Brightweiser. You can go look at him. Yeah. So their honeymoon period of their relationship which lasts for years, several years. The, I get the stealing and hoarding and... Yeah, the plunder drunkness of their yes. relationship. There's like a point that's a little bit of like a pinnacle where they're both just so pleased with themselves. And they're they're like wandering through some town and they, they see this ancient urn made of silver and gold in the front window of this European town. And Brightweiser enters this gallery and then goes and asks, like, he calls out to the whoever works there and is like, hello, anyone here? And he hears that the man is upstairs. And the, the guy says that he'll be right down the stairs. But when they're in there, he just takes that urn out of the shop window and mm-hmm. just leaves with Anne Catherine. And then they go to this little hotel and they are just like so pleased with themselves for stealing it. And Anne Kleinklaus calls the gallery and asks how much the urn in the window is. And the guy says, it's about 100,000 euros or whatever the money was back in that moment. This is like 2000 or something. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you have to come see it. It's amazing. So he still hasn't even gone down the stairs to see if it's been stolen. Right. It's just so easy. They're, you know, they're learning like... It's so easy to take these things. It's like taking candy from a baby. They're pushing it. They're pushing the envelope a little bit, too. Yeah, they feel like they can just take anything at any time. Mm. Um, I mean, he's the one who's really into it, but yeah. So obviously these things are stolen and there are investigations happening, but no one is on to them really as as the thieves. Which so, is just shocking that they didn't get, that there aren't physical descriptions of them too and all of that. I mean, that's a lot of museums to steal from. It's pretty shocking. I mean, I'm going to get to the point where they do have a moment where they get caught. But before I do, I'll st- yeah, these things would be stolen and they would have no leads as to who took them. They have mm-hmm. like one grainy ass video from a museum in France that shows Brightweiser taking something, but they can't even get an image of what he looks like. Right. So anyway, they keep up with all their, you know, on top of the giddiness of having all these objects in their apartment, they're also reading all the articles that are coming out about it and they are just loving it. Oh my God. They're basking in their own crime. Yes, exactly. So, okay, all this to keep on the timeline, this is all leading up to 2000. So this is like happening between 1995 and 2000. Mm -hmm. They've taken hundreds of things. In fact, by Breitweiser's calculation, it's like 200 thefts that amount in 300 stolen objects. Impressive. Yeah. Over the span of five years or six years. So that would math wise be like a theft every week or something. Maybe Mm -hmm. He takes an entire hallway of paintings from a French museum. I mean, it's like stuff like that. It's it's insane. And they are they are just going at it. Sometimes even just like on a guided tour, they would take things while on the tour, just like slip it into their purse or into Mm -hmm. his pants or whatever. And there was even a time where he was like walking through an art fair and someone yells thief like after he had taken something and he looks he kind of looks back and sees that it's someone else getting caught. So he just keeps stealing (laughs) a bunch of shit while they're chasing another thief. Yeah. Ballsy. Very ballsy. There are like very close calls, like the time that he shattered a glass case. And there's another time where he stole something and got to the car and there was a cop giving him a traffic ticket or parking ticket. And he had some shit that he'd (laughs) stolen and he talked the cop out of the ticket. Wow. And got in the car with his stolen loot and left. Wow. Yeah. They go to an art gallery in Lucerne, Switzerland. And so... It does matter that it's it's harder to steal stuff in the summer. Why? Well, take a wild guess. Because it's daylight for longer. 
Mm, that's a good guess, but it's that's not. Oh, the I got it! I got it! I got it! What is it? What is it? <laughs> it's because you have more clothing options, and I mean, you, you're wearing a big coat in the winter and in the summer you are wearing shorts and a t-shirt yeah just like we are right now that was the clumsiest <laughs> way to say that answer i couldn't have done but you you're right that's um yeah. so yeah summertime is not a great time to steal stuff for all of you thinking of doing it and it's just a dumb time to do it anyway they're doing it anyway because they do it all the time um they go into this gallery in lucerne and the gallery is right across from a police station and even the girlfriend Klein Klaus says, let's not do anything at this one. I have a bad feeling about it. But mm. there's a still life by a, a Dutch painter from the 17th century. And Brightweiser literally just puts the painting right under his arm like it's a fucking baguette or something and walks <laughs> out. And a gallery employee sees this happen because it's just like, oh, wow. Yeah. And comes out and like, you know, yells at them and grabs them and takes them to the police station and they go into the police station and they stay there overnight just one night and they convince the police like oh sorry we just we've never done this before we're on a romantic vacation of some (laughs) sort we just thought it'd be fun thing to do it's the first time we've ever done it they apologize a million times so they do some fingerprints and they write something up and they let him go wow i'm Mm -hmm. sure the cops are thinking like of course this is their first time he just took it in broad daylight in front of a guard like Mm -hmm. this is clearly the first time he's ever tried to do anything like that yeah so they feel they feel quite shocked after this and the girlfriend especially and she's like we're never going to switzerland again to steal anything ever and he's like yeah okay we'll never do that and they and they're like let's take a break from being art thieves for a little while take a while guess how long they took a break for one week a little longer. Three weeks. Three weeks. That's Three all. Weeks. That's as long as they could go. Yeah. He had an addiction. Yeah. He, he had a hunger. Yeah, definitely. He goes, like three weeks later, he goes to an auction in Paris and steals a a painting by a Flemish painter. This is obviously a thing. He loves these paintings that are from like Flemish paintings and so on. So he steals one of those. It's like of a grape harvest. Yeah. See, he's getting the like the dopamine rush, the adrenaline fix thing. This is, yeah. he's taking it to a whole different level. Exactly. So here's the part where everything starts kind of changing. They are living amongst this multi-million dollar art collection in a suburb with his mom and the girlfriend is working at a hospital does mom know anything about this nothing nothing she has no idea she thinks that she's just working antique like that he goes to like flea markets and stuff and has some sort of thing for antiques but she has no idea like what the value of these antiques are he never shows them to her he just like rushes them up into but she's like always at work Right. And she probably isn't like snooping around his room or anything. So or his little apartment. Right. So she maybe doesn't know. But it just seems like with who their father was, like she would have some kind of knowledge of the kind of stuff that he was taking. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she's turning a blind eye. Maybe she was super depressed, too. That's true. That's true. Her rich ass husband left her. Right. And she had she's just trying to make it. She's she's like working so hard just to keep the two of them afloat. You know, and yeah. and the girlfriend in a way. So yeah, but the girlfriend, um, Klein Klaus, she's getting like real tired of this relationship. She wants other things. She wants a family. Mm-hmm. She cannot see that happening in this kind of setting, and she cannot right. see that happening with this kind of partner. And I think she's even losing interest in his like obsession. Like it's very exciting the novelty for a while. has worn off. Definitely, they're having tons of fights. I mean, this is according to his recollection. She has never talked to media ever about this stuff yeah they're just fighting all the time he wants to keep stealing shit she's tired of it she wants to have kids she's 30 this is what she wants to do in their fights they're making like mild teeny tiny compromises like he will never stop he's like nope never gonna stop and so she's like okay well we at least wear surgical gloves like the rubber gloves like while you do it because they you know there's this one place in switzerland that has her fingerprints now so please just she's trying to talk some sense into him yeah He promises that he'll wear the gloves. I bet he doesn't wear the gloves. Guess what? You're right. (laughs) He goes and steals something, brings it back. He's so excited about it. She's just like rolling her eyes on the bed like, here's just another fucking object I have to walk around. And that is probably going to put my ass in jail one day. Right. Stefan and his antiques. Right. Here's another one. I don't care that it's 500 years old and that the (laughs) most important painter ever made it. You know, she's sick of it. He brings something back. It's like, oh, he brings a bugle. 
this like curled bugle he loved bugles so much <laughs> i love that this is his object of choice <laughs> yeah he steals this bugle from like the 1580s it's so obnoxious yeah and i mean he's obsessed with these bugles i don't know <laughs> he was so proud of his theft because he had to like get up on top of a radiator and balance very carefully and like cut the bugle was like hanging and he had to like cut the strings mm. and take it and like brought it back and then of course he's so thrilled and comes and tells Anne all about it and she's like all she cares to know is did you wear gloves and he tells her the truth and he says I didn't Oof. yeah oh no and she's pissed and she's like I'm, I'm so yeah she's like I'm gonna go drive up to this fucking castle or whatever museum it was that you stole this from and I'm gonna go clean out all the fingerprints and he begs wow. to go with her and she's like fine you can drive, but you're not going in the museum. I'm going in there by myself. So he agrees to that. And they park. She goes in the museum. And he walks. And he's, like, trying to look through the museum to see what she's doing. And he watches her. She goes to this case and is, like, trying to wipe it with. She has, like, a little bottle of rubbing alcohol and stuff. And she's mm -hmm. just trying to wipe it clean. And he's watching her. And then there's a man with a dog who walks by him. This matters because... She comes running out of the museum, and she's never come running out of any museum before. And right, they always keep it cool, calm, and collected. Exactly. And she's like, it's like she's trying to tell him something. And then a cop car comes up right behind him, and she just goes and gets in the car and drives away. So when she was in there, the guy with the dog called someone that was, he had read the headline, like that this bugle had been stolen <laughs> by somebody, and he called someone who worked at the museum and said there's this guy who's outside and he's like looking into the museum in a weird way and I think it's the person that stole the bugle but the girlfriend's in there while this phone call's happening so the she hears overhears the person talking mm. to him on the phone and the person's like oh where what does he look like da, 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 da. and then that's why she was running out of the museum to warn him but he got caught so he gets wow. arrested and put in jail holy um, shit so her being extra cautious made him get caught actually <laughs> that's yes. the, the reason why he got caught is because she demanded to go back and clean his fingerprints <laughs> yeah exactly this is at the <laughs> richard wagner museum which is like in a country manner and you know it's like this beautiful is it's it like switzerland yes yes okay it is it is in Switzerland, which was their other rule. It was like, do not go. That's why she was so adamant about it. It was like, I told you not to do the fingerprint thing here. Yeah. So he is put in jail and he's just like in jail for weeks, actually, in Switzerland. Just for this heist? I mean, surely they go to his house. Well, here's what happens. He spends that night in jail. This is in 2001. And the next morning they begin interrogations. So they're asking him questions and he isn't selling them anything. Somehow they have not located what his address is. He could, like claims that he does he doesn't want them to go to the house. So he's trying of course he doesn't to avoid mentioning his mom, his girlfriend, anything. I mean he's just delaying the process and they didn't know that um Klein Klaus had been with him at the time. They didn't know she was in the museum and overheard this. They didn't Right. They right. thought he was alone. So they, they nabbed him, but she got away in, right. the, in the arrest. Yeah. And he was telling them that he was poor and he was like maybe homeless and trying to buy, like steal something for money, you know, to make right. some money. And he, he well, didn't want them poking around. What was this cave's name? Alibaba's cave. Alibaba's cave. <laughs> yeah. So it, honestly, he is in there for a couple weeks, just in a jail cell in Switzerland. And he's he has no idea what's going on. He's not allowed to make phone calls. Hmm. No one is trying to contact him. Why do I imagine Swiss jails as being nice? nice? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Uh, plenty of like phone fondue. calls. Yeah, <laughs> fondue and phone calls. <laughs> yeah, I kind of picture it like you have a view of something beautiful, like the Alps, and yeah, just very nicely painted and yeah. soothing colors and things like that. Something tells me that's not the case, but I guess not. Yeah, he was in this jail cell for a while. He doesn't know what's going on. What is he most worried about? His objects. Of course. That's the thing that he's worried about more than anything. It's his objects. And after weeks in jail and no one visiting and no one writing and them somehow not going to his mom's house, which I think is so weird. I know. That's shocking. I mean, this is 2001, not like 1810. <laughs> you know, like, isn't that a first thing you do? Just go to the house of his like family yeah, member? Yeah. 
I don't understand that part of this whole thing. Maybe they were busy. Maybe it was a busy time. It was 2001. I mean, it is like crossing There's a lot going on in the world in 2001. You know, it's different countries are involved because his house was in France and a French suburb. And let's be real. He was stealing a fucking bugle. So. Yeah. But it is weird that he's just kept in jail, but no one's bailing him out. Yeah. So. Anyway. Probably just the bugle is not higher on their priority list. Right. Then there's one day where he goes into um, an interrogation with a detective and the detective has a photograph of a metal it looks like kind of rusty and worn out but it's this gold metal and so this lieutenant shows it to him and says we know you stole this and he just looks at them kind of baffled and he recognizes it but he also wonders why it looks so damaged Mm. so this guy says just tell us what you did and after that Everything will be okay. We'll let you go. Classic cop rhetoric. That will never be the case. They'll never (laughs) just let you go. I mean, if they do, I don't know. They'll rarely let you go. Yeah. So he's just like, yep, I'll tell you everything. He says, yeah, I took that. Oh, my God. Then this lieutenant takes another photograph out of the drawer and puts it in front of him. And it's of a snuff box. And it looks damaged, too. And then he's like, and you took this? And he's like, "Uh, yep, I took that one, too. And then it's just another photograph after another photograph of all these objects, all of them looking kind of damaged, all of them objects he's stolen. And he just is like, yeah, I took that. I took that. I took that. I took that. Yeah, I took that flute from Denmark. I took that (laughs) goblet. I took that dagger. Mm -hmm, That's me. I took that one, too. I took all those (laughs) things. And he's just like admitting, admitting, admitting. But this is like his first sight of these things even though it's oh and he's probably actually loving this a photograph it's so it's so stupid for him to, to admit that but i bet this is this might be one of the first times that he's really gotten to brag right in a major way and i don't know if he's bragging well but he's admitting to confessing every single item and providing the details and dates of when he took them yeah which is like dude he's where is your it. lawyer <laughs> like yeah, what I know. are you yeah. doing like you're smart obviously yeah. in some you ways you can never that take not... that back you can never take that interview he admitted back. stealing 140 objects oh my god <laughs> yeah no <laughs> i mean and the thing is if the... i was his lawyer i would i don't know yeah i would pass out if i heard that the lieutenant was definitely about to pass out. He couldn't believe that this guy who just seemed like a really normal whatever was the one who took all these things. So what he does notice, though, is that on a folder, it's written objects found in the rhone rhine Canal. Hmm. So this is the part that he's really interested in. He's like, wait, these objects were found in what canal? Uh-oh. And And Catherine. Yeah. And also this canal is like something that was built during like napoleon's era to connect all these rivers in france it's like this very murky slow canal it's just like still water right not very far from his house in france so that's when he's like oh that's why they're oxidized and rusty and looking damaged they've been in the water so he finds out that i mean it takes a while for him to find out exactly what happened but what what ends up happening is that the girlfriend ran back to the house tells the mom everything i mean i guess and Mm -hmm. they i mean this is all kind of like him trying to figure it out because none so we don't know the actual we don't but it's kind of like what else would have happened okay they took all the stuff and they dumped it in a canal in this canal wow yeah not the paintings just the objects that was not very smart no it was not very smart she's not very smart she's not a very good criminal Anne catherine well she was really good and then he it got into a real mess and the mom like he imagines his mom being so pissed at learning that she's been supporting her son all this time and he's like 30 years old he's been living at her house and then on top of that he's been putting her life in danger that she's been all this stuff is on her property Mm -hmm. so they throw all the stuff in the canal and then someone who's wandering around the canal one day like sees a shiny object and like lifts it and it's like this goblet you know and then it like sees another shiny object and lifts it and some other that had to be fun all these treasures and so the police are called and they like drain the canal and they just get all these things i mean so much it's all these objects 140 objects that they had thrown in the canal so yeah that's what happened with that and i would love to see pictures from that excavation yes like that would be cool i know i wish they made a documentary about this i know i want to see like all the water be drained from the canal and then there all those objects just laying in the bed of the canal yeah that would be cool exactly he wants to know 
like what happened to the paintings so there are no one has found the paintings there's no sign of them anywhere. Mm-hmm. So he believes that his mom just took them into a forest. There's actually like a description of how he imagines it. I'll try to be um, very quick. So there are all these like still lifes, portraits, landscapes by Cronach, Bruegel, Teniers, Durer, von Kessel, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I mean, it just goes on and on. These are pieces that have survived hundreds of years. What he thinks, this is his vision of what he thinks happened. He thinks that it's about like almost 70 paintings that his mom just put them in a stack all of these paintings oh my God. set them on fire oh no. and that the girlfriend and the mom maybe just like watch these paintings burn oh my god yeah so he oh. is after all this he's put on suicide watch he is about to yeah no shit yeah, he's miserable. His life is has no value at all. He has several psychologists coming in to analyze him. Their reports say that he is cocky and I mean, they're imagine that. They're yeah. used to whatever, <laughs> but but they don't think that he is a kleptomaniac. That this does not fit within kleptomania because what? well, because Okay, because he specifically selected his loot rather than randomly grabbing and never displayed guilt about his actions, he doesn't fit the criteria for being a kleptomaniac. I would like to revisit that. Just, I mean, I don't know what the exact parameters for kleptomania, but I would say when you're stealing something every week. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe that's just like a career or whatever, but still. Interesting. Yeah. I kind of want to go back. That makes me want to go and look at what the like exact definition of kleptomania is. Right. So he's getting diagnosed with this, that, and the other, but they don't really think he has any mental illness, which I'm also kind of like, mm, I don't know, but what do I know? So the mom goes to trial for her role in destroying the work and is found guilty. She spends a few months in jail. Oh, she gets jail time. Yeah. Wow. In court, she says that she thought she didn't know anything about the stuff, but Anne Catherine spends a single night in jail. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Somehow she tells a story that really worked. She says she had no idea um, that she played no role in any way. Ooh. I mean, though, that's smart on her end. So Smart on her end, yeah. And Breitweiser doesn't try to throw her under the bus either. So he just stays. He says, yeah, she had no involvement in Aww. this at all. And so she... Um, Solid dude. She has one night in jail, which I don't even know what was that for. She's never charged with destroying art or being... She's never convicted with any involvement with the thefts. There's nothing like that. He is still in love with her and has hopes that he keeps writing her letters and he's like he, he thinks they could be reunited after oh he gets out of jail but she had started another relationship with someone and got pregnant and by the time he learns about this she already has a baby and a family everything that she wanted and he hates her oh. so now he's talking about her very openly that's oh. why we know all this he's so oh so he pissed. let it all go so he told the whole story Once of her involvement he finds out that she's got a baby like it's it's all done oh. and he's like okay guess what she was never a, mind not a solid all this. <laughs> yeah he's released from prison in 2005 at the age of 33 he's miserable he takes jobs cutting trees landscaping he and his mom are cool with each other despite what happened he would go to he is banned from every single museum like it never allowed to go. Oh any yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, he probably like all over the world. They have just banned him. Right. They. I mean, probably to an extent. But yeah, definitely in Europe, there, he's not allowed to go anywhere. He steals another painting though. He managed oh to steal a painting in Belgium. This dude. It's a Bruegel landscape. He says it slayed him, quote unquote. Um, and he couldn't help himself, so he just took the painting, put it in his apartment. He gets caught. He goes back to jail. Oh, he gets out when he's lessons, 41 Stephon. years old. That's the pictures you're seeing of him when he's 41 years old. And he is so depressed, miserable beyond belief. And all he wants is this life to continue. He just wants to keep stealing stuff. So then in early 2018, he goes to the Rubens House Museum. I don't know how he's still going to this, but I guess people don't have like face recognition, which I'm very anti face recognition stuff anyway. But you know, he can still go to these places because what are they going to? They're like little museums with like an old person. Yeah, you know? there's not going to be that crazy of security. Oh, so also he sees a picture of his Adam and Eve sculpture. It's made it back to the Rubens Museum. And this feels like a betrayal to him or something. Almost like he thinks the sculpture is cheating on him. I don't even know. <laughs> and he is just a mess about the stuff. He goes back to that museum and he 
returns and stares at it and i don't think he tries to steal it because like that would be pretty stupid but he oh he just stares longingly at it he just stares at it longingly and there's a quote where he said art has punished me the latest on him is that in february of 2019 this year he was arrested um for stealing more things there were things found in his (laughs) this is kleptomania people (laughs) yeah in france uh roman coins and some other objects for museums from france and germany and he is again incarcerated um there's another investigation happening and he is writing a book (laughs) oh my god i will read that book yeah i will too so that's the end of that one Wow. And I, there's so much I didn't even cover. But, well, we've been, I've been talking to you for like two hours or something. So, <laughs> fascinating. Maybe yeah. he deserves a two parter. Man, I don't even know. I'm blown away by this. One. I really want her to come out and tell. I want I her book. Where is her book? I know. She's like just trying to raise her kid. Man. I mean, that her kid's excellent. like a teenager now. Yeah. Man. Good story. Thanks, Veronica. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for listening to my attempt to tell this in a linear (laughs) fashion and bearing with me the whole time. It was just so hard to condense into 30 minutes. I usually, I'm into brevity. Oh, it's definitely not 30 minutes. (laughs) This one, oh, I know. I mean, it's been an hour and a half. So, yeah, thanks for listening. And um, this podcast is brought to you by We Own This Town, which is run by Michael Eads. He's amazing. He's actually featured on... Another podcast that I love called Nashville Demystified. Yes. And that's hosted by Alex Steed. Yeah, he's awesome. This is just the coolest little podcast network to be a part of. It's all Nashville-based podcasts that are about different things. A lot of them are about music, but some of them are about cool alcohol, like liquid gold, and fan (laughs) fiction, which is about fan fiction, and... I'm, there's a lot that I'm not remembering. Hot Minute is hilarious. So um, Yeah, there's some really good podcasts on this network, so go yeah. check it out. We're very happy to be in this podcast home. And our artwork is by Saskia Kolgis. And our theme song is by Patrick Dampier. Bye. Bye. She's not in jail? Um, no. Oh, but she did have to go to jail. But oh no, we got to uh, stay on the timeline. Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, um, I'm gonna cut that out. I'm gonna edit it out. Um, so.